To me, the most beautiful word in the dictionary is tariff. Trump is He's proposing a 60% tariff on items imported from China and a 10 to 20% for all other countries. One. When Republican Donald Trump riled up his supporters during the presidential campaign with a promise to enforce tariffs of 10 to 20 percent or even more on imports, I wondered if they knew prices would increase on many everyday items they buy. After the election, which ex-President Trump won with ease over Democratic Vice President Kamala Harris, I came across this post on the Internet. A woman in Pennsylvania wrote that her husband returned home from work and announced he would not be getting a Christmas bonus this year. She asked him why, and he told her the company CEO had a meeting with employees and said he needed the bonus money to stock up on goods manufactured overseas before Trump takes office in January. He's anticipating higher costs when tariffs are imposed. I was discussing this issue with my co-host, Dr. Taji Terrell, and found out that she had taught a course called Global Fashion Economy during her tenure as a professor of fashion merchandising at Youngstown State University. Hello, Professor Terrell. Thank you for sharing your knowledge of this crucially important issue. Let me start with this dumb question. What is a tariff? All right, well, I'm going to have some lecture slides for you. Before I define tariffs, I'm going to talk a little bit about global trade because you need to understand global trade to understand what tariffs are. United States produces a lot of products that other countries don't have, and we manufacture them in the US, and we sell them to other countries. So those are our exports. So we export a lot of products to other countries, like machinery, engines, uh, other equipment, electronics, computers, semiconductors, aircraft, like uh, airplanes, helicopters, spacecraft. We export cars, trucks, auto parts, we export agricultural products like soybeans, corn, wheat, uh, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, oil, plastics, petroleum, uh, chemicals. Uh, we export certain foods and beverages like whiskey. We export precious metals, uh, gold, silver, and so on. So we sell these to other countries, and those are our exports. Uh, and mm -hmm. the reason I'm explaining this is because I think a lot of people don't understand the difference between imports and exports. And right. that's experience teaching the class. So for stuff that we don't have in the U.S., we don't either uh, produce them in the U.S. or we, we can't grow them here. We buy them from other countries, and those are our imports. So we import machinery, equipment, electronics, uh, telecommunication equipment, uh, cars, auto parts, oil, uh, especially fashion products like clothing, shoes. Uh, we import, for example, coffee, seafood, you know, other fruits and vegetables. We import plastics, we import metals like steel, aluminum, copper. Um, we import furniture, kitchenware, home goods, and all that stuff. So this is basically the global trade. And as a country, you have to have some kind of balance when you are trading. So your right. imports and exports should be balanced, and that's called a trade balance. So if you have, uh, for example, too many exports and not, in, you know, not a lot of imports, then you have a trade surplus. But if you have everything you are importing from other countries, you're not selling to other countries much, then you have a trade deficit. So that's why we have tariffs. Tariff is a, just a tax that is government imposed on imported products. That's the main definition. But I think what we are lacking is a good understanding of how tariffs work, uh, I think most people don't understand that. Like, let's take an American company like Levi's, which makes jeans, right? So Levi's uh, has headquarters in, in San Francisco. Uh, okay. So they do employ people. Uh, they provide employment in the United States. And uh, these are product developers, designers. And those people design the jeans. They do the research and development. They do the design. Uh, and they decide, you know, what kind of jeans what style, what colors, um, you know, what kind of treatment the denim fabric is going to have. All of that is decided in the United States. And then they find producers to produce the jeans, right? So right. in any case, uh, Levi's mostly gets their production in China. So what they do is they um, talk to a manufacturer in China and they ask them to give them a price, but they send every little detail about the jeans, what they want, what style they want, 
they send a, a spec sheet, specification sheet to China, and they say, give us a price. So let's just have this made in China Levi's product. Uh, we are doing a product development in the US. So let's say, you know, we are going to order 20,000 jeans from China, uh, but our prices are going to be per one pair of jeans, right? So we do the product development and let's say it's $10 is the cost of product development per jeans. Okay. I mean, I'm making up these numbers. I'm yes. just trying yeah. to explain how that works. Um, so Chinese factory says, okay, we're going to order uh, your fabric. We're going to get it dyed to whatever color you want. Uh, we'll get the jeans produced. And we are going to do whatever, you know, enzyme wash, stone wash, whatever treatment you want. We are going to do that. We're going to package the jeans. We are going to put the price tags, the UPC barcodes, everything on them, ready to go to the retail store. And once we finish 20,000 jeans, we are going to, going to take them to a Chinese port to be shipped to the United States. And that's where our responsibility ends. And we want $5 per jeans. Okay. Okay. So they give you the price to do all of that work. When overseas companies give you a price, they are FOB, which means free on board. That means, you know, the product is going to be manufactured, packaged, finished, put in a container, and the container will be in a cargo ship in the country's port. And after that point on, it's the responsibility of the U.S. company. Okay. Uh, and I worked, I worked in manufacturing in Turkey, and we shipped a lot of products to the United States, to United Kingdom, uh, and it always works like this. So um, in that case, the U.S. company is responsible for the shipping cost. So when the cargo ship goes all the way from China to, um, you know, either the New York port or the right. California port, uh, they have to go through customs and border protection so that Levi's can receive the products that they ordered. Right. And to receive the products, they have to pay the price, they have to pay the shipping cost, and they also have to pay the tariffs. So whatever the tariffs are on one pair of jeans, you know, they multiply it with 20,000 jeans and they pay that amount. So let's say tariffs are $3 per jeans. So the total cost for Levi's becomes $20 for a pair of jeans. Right. And they do the markup, and the markup is usually 100%, but it's not considered 100% in the fashion industry, but that's a whole different story. Well, hold on. When you say markup, that means if the total cost is 20 and the markup is 20, so that markup would, in, would be the profit that Levi's that's, would have? Yes, that's their profit. And then the okay. final MSRP price that is at the retail store, like when right. you amazing right. buy Levi's, you pay $40. That's the price that's going to be in retail. So the $40 is paid by us, by the consumer. Right, right. right? So that's how much it is. And I mean, we currently do have tariffs on uh, clothing that comes from China. And that's true for a lot of other products. But I'm giving the example of clothing just you know, to give you an idea. So uh, that's the current situation. Now, if we have... Uh, more tariffs, if we impose tariffs so that we can help domestic companies, domestic producers in the US, which is the purpose of tariffs. You know, you're trying right. to protect domestic companies uh, so that they don't have such a huge competition with foreign companies, right? So let's say we decide to make it made in USA Levi's jeans, and we are still doing the product development in the US, so it's still going to be $10. Your manufacturing cost is going to be so much more because now you have to pay minimum wage in U.S. standards, right? So it's almost $15 an hour, let's say minimum. Uh, but in China, it's 30 cents, 50 cents an hour, right? Okay. So I said $50, but it may be way more than that in the U.S. Uh, so I'll say manufacturing cost is $50. To make oh, does, that, does that manufacturing cost include the cost of fabric? Because the fabric is not made in, right now, for the Levi jeans, the fabric is not made in America, right? It's made overseas. Well, so that's a whole another story. Okay. But let's just assume that it's $50 just to make the numbers okay. you know, a little bit All right. Okay. 
so that's another story that I can talk a lot about. Okay. Um, so let's say it costs $50 for Levi's to make it made in USA. Yes. And of course, they are not going to pay shipping because it's not coming. Right. Uh, they're not going to pay tariffs, so they save money there. But then the total cost is $60. Right. You mark up on it, and your retail price becomes $120. Right? So now, instead of paying 40 bucks for a pair of Levi's jeans, now we have to pay $120 for Levi's jeans. So it's a lose-lose situation for the consumers. Either way, the price goes up. And uh, right now... Uh, hey, Taji, how, how do these companies justify a markup of 100%? Well, in fashion, that's usually the case uh, because, one, you know, the styles go out of fashion quickly, so you have to count uh, for uh, that. Um, and they don't call it a 100% markup. They call it a 50% markup because they inflated <laughs> based on the MSRP price. So it's a percent. Right the MSRP price. So in that case, it's a 50% markup. But of course, you know, there are other things that they um, calculate and it's, it's usually doubled in price when they sell in retail. So in your example here, if Levi's was forced to start manufacturing its jeans in the United States, in your example, consumers would pay around a hundred bucks instead of $40, right? Right. right. Now, you know, these are not exact numbers, of course. No, no, no. We're just we're just sort of showing right. an overall that there is an increase in the, the price of a product if mm -hmm. it's manufactured domestically, right? Right. Okay. What has studies shown as far as consumers go and their willingness to pay more? For so a basically, when the prices go up, the sales usually go down. Okay. You, you're not able to sell as many products as you, you were able to sell with lower prices, right? So the sales will reduce uh, in that case. Uh, also, I mean, especially today, people are so used to paying such little prices for clothing and fashion. Uh, right. right. There may be a resistance to paying uh, such high prices, but if they are willing to pay, then it's going to cost them. And there are studies that actually show that uh, Trump's tariffs may cost. There are a couple of different resources, and I'm going to tell you exactly who they are. Uh, so the Tax Foundation said that those tariffs may increase uh, consumer expenditures by $6,000 a year per American household. Wow. Uh, American Action Forum says a 10% tariff would cost between $1,700 and $2,350 uh, per U.S. household. And then there are a couple other numbers like Peterson Institute for International Economics. Um, they estimate about $2,600 a year. Uh, Yale Budget Lab did a study and you know, depending on the tariffs and how much the tariffs are, it may be uh, between 1900 and 7600 per household. You know, so that's the kind of range of increase in your expenses in the U.S. Uh, when the tariffs go up. OK, yeah. so during the campaign, Trump supporters have got really excited when he talked about tariffs. And a lot of Americans view tariffs as, quote, punishment. Uh, against these foreign countries that, you know, unfair trade on artificially, you know, uh, lowering the price, the cost of production, government subsidies, all of those things. So Americans are saying, OK, you know, it's not a level playing field. And Donald Trump is absolutely right. Let's impose all of these tariffs and make it really difficult. But with these foreign countries that are now exporting to the United States, would they sort of just take this lying down or what happens when when the Trump administration and Donald Trump announces tariffs of 10 to 20 percent or in some cases, maybe even 60 percent? What happens? Actually, I mean, all of those are not incorrect. You know, pe what people are saying tariffs will do. And I'm going to explain that. You okay. know, um, in my next slide, so I'll actually talk about why do we have tariffs? Tariffs can be actually useful in certain cases. Um, 
And to understand that, you also have to understand like free trade versus protected trade. Right. So it depends on the government's trade policy. Some governments are more for protectionist trade because um, if you have a lot of protections on trade, like tariffs, then it helps the domestic companies. Uh, it may help with jobs. Um, but then uh, with free trade, the consumer prices go down. So it's easier on people when they're buying everyday goods. And also you have more choices uh, in terms of products. So for example, you know, if there's no free trade, uh, an American will not be able to try Colombian coffee, for example, unless you go right. to Colombia, right? right? So that's okay. kind of the point with free trade versus protectionist trade. And sometimes you need to protect trade in certain areas. Um, and, you know, another uh, interesting fact is, for example, you know, in China, when they were in during the communist regime, uh, they had a very protectionist trade policy. And during that time, you know, they were very isolated. Whatever they produced, they used that those products. They right. didn't buy much from others. They didn't sell much. But uh, it's when they started free trade uh, is when their economy just blew up and grew so fast. Now they are one of the highest GDPs in the world, right? So free trade is generally a good thing and it grows the economy. But um, we have tariffs to protect domestic producers. Of course, when you protect domestic companies, you're protecting local jobs as well. Right. There are also national security concerns. You know, if there are uh, critical items for your defense that you're using in your defense industry, like steel, for example, right. uh, you don't want to be completely dependent on other countries. You want to have your own production as well. Um, and also... It's a political tool to negotiate with other countries. So when you're imposing tariffs on China, you can also use that as an ex as a negotiating tool to negotiate certain things, or you can punish that country if you know there are certain things that is threatening your security. Uh, you may impose tariffs on them. So it is definitely uh, a negotiating tool as well. And also, of course, it's a revenue for the government. So the government takes that money as tax, uh, even though it's paid by American consumers or American companies who are importing, it still goes to the government, right? So right. there are positive sides of tariffs, um, but of course, you know, the foreign companies are not going to just accept it. They can also retaliate. So there are a lot of um, disadvantages to tariffs as well. So if you look at the impact on US consumers, yeah, I mean, may support local jobs, right. but that is a potential benefit. It may not happen. And I'm gonna explain to you why it usually doesn't happen. Uh, generally, you know, the prices will go up, the choices will be reduced. Well, I'll give you another example. Chinese electric vehicles. Yeah. I mean, they are amazing. I don't know if you've ever seen one, but my brother bought one in Turkey. The, he has a plug-in hybrid. And it has this camera. It's not just a back camera. It shows your car from the side, from the other side, from the top. Oh. You can pick where you want to see your car from, what perspective. It talks to you like chat GPT. I mean, it's just, you know, pretty cool cars. Uh, and currently we have a 100% tariff on Chinese electric cars. So we don't have any in the U.S. We don't have that choice in the U.S. We cannot buy Chinese cars because okay but in, in turkey in turkey what how does the price of the chinese electric uh, hybrid compare to other cars that are sold that are other hybrids that are sold in turkey um i believe it's cheaper than toyotas even and with the tariffs even well in turkey i mean i'm sure they have tariffs because they have like ridiculous taxes on cars <laughs> In yeah. Turkey, ridic ridiculous tariffs on like iPhones as well. I mean, okay. it's almost a hundred percent tariff on cars and on iPhone. But for some reason, the Chinese, I think they had some kind of agreement with China. So it's uh, a slightly reduced tariff wow. on Chinese okay. electric cars. Uh, so a lot of, and they are much cheaper than, you know, all the other uh, sure. brands and others. So people are buying oh, them. Oh, okay. Again, the tariffs uh, also create reduced choice. So you don't have those choices if right. you have a lot of tariffs. 
And the impact on domestic companies, I mean, yes, it's less competition with foreign companies, so that may benefit them. But there, just like you mentioned earlier, there's no company that manufactures everything in the U.S. Right. So like you right. said, the fabric, they may still have to import it, right? Uh -huh. Car companies, they still import a lot of their raw materials, you know. Um, sure. So when there's a tariff on those raw materials, then their cost is still going to go up. Right. right? And so it has like a double effect, even on domestic companies um, and their cost, and then eventually the final consumer prices. You know, there is politically, we, we talked about the, the, the political aspect of this whole thing. And there are politicians who have accused American companies of not being nationalistic by moving production overseas. Um, but these companies have shareholders who, who demand, you know, a return on their investment. So in your study of this issue, why do American companies go, look overseas to make their products? Well, uh, I mean, it's, it's reduced cost mostly. Okay. Uh, labor cost is much higher in the US and it's much cheaper in certain companies. And even China is now becoming a little bit higher in terms of labor costs. So they go into you know, other countries that offer better prices, maybe Indonesia or maybe you know, Bangladesh and so on. Right. Um, but in certain products, every time a, com a country um, starts to manufacture things overseas, when they are more developed and they focus on more value added products manufacturing in their own country. So as a country uh, becomes a more developed country, for example, they stop manufacturing clothing and yes. they want to find cheaper countries to manufacture them because they want to focus on more value added products like technology, you know, electronics um, and so on. Um, so this is a trend in every country. For less developed countries, for example, apparel manufacturing is a great industry to start their economy going uh, because it's cheaper. You know, it doesn't require a lot of capital. Uh, it's relatively easier to find people to sew garments and then they can grow. So this is not necessarily something we really need to make in the U.S. Right? It's just not worth it. Um, but it's also, you know, um, the availability of certain products can also impact that. For example, you know, Egyptian cotton is really good quality cotton. So you may want to buy, buy it from there or like Italian shoes are much right. better than other right. shoes. So you want to buy those, you know, because they are experts in producing really high quality shoes. So, um, so there are a lot of reasons for people to. Shop so, but but Donald Trump sort of reduced this whole issue to such a simple discussion, which was, if I impose tariffs on all of these imports that are coming in, it'll force American companies to start producing those goods in America. Well, let's uh, talk about that. <laughs> okay, please do, because... You know, he's talking about automobiles that are made in Mexico and, and putting a 60% tariff or whatever it is, or 20% or whatever he talked about on these cars that that GM and manufacturers in Mexico and therefore forcing General Motors to say, OK, we're going to shut down all of these overseas plants and we're going to bring all the manufacturing to America. Does America need foreign trade in order to survive? Because remember, during the campaign, Donald Trump talked about America first. That's his agenda. Yeah. And there's been a there's been a long time school of thought that says we really don't need foreign trade. We can produce and use whatever we make in this country and survive very well. Is that a realistic view of the world? Well, it's really not, and I'll, I'll explain 
one okay. point two. Let's talk about car manufacturing in the U.S. All right. Okay. So, let me show you this. So, I mean, I just have this map, so I'm just going to show you this. So, okay. um, when you look at U.S., Canada, and Mexico, there are no tariffs for yes. anything coming from Mexico or from Canada because we have a free trade agreement. Um, right. With those countries, right? It it used to be called NAFTA. Now it's called U.S. Um, right. Canada Agreement or something, but it's the same thing. No tariffs. So uh, when we are making cars in the U.S., like American cars, do you know how many times they move uh, between these countries? You know, like the car manufacturing is done between these three countries in collaboration. So apparently the parts keep moving across the borders almost eight times during manufacturing because, you know, one part is made in the U.S., it's sent to Mexico, then Mexico puts something on it, it's go it goes back to U.S., it goes to Canada for something else, it comes back to U.S. So there's a lot of movement and that's how we are producing American cars. So when they say the car is made in America, that's a misnomer, isn't it? Because... It's not 100% American-made parts and all of that in the car, is it? Um, not exactly, but there are certain rules about putting a Made in USA label. You know, okay. if you do majority of the production or at least a significant part of the production in the U.S., then you can right. put a Made in USA right. label on it. But most products are not 100% Made in USA. Okay. Uh, so we are doing this and imagine having tariffs on Mexico, you know, now every time something crosses the border, you have tariffs on it and then it goes to Canada, you have tariffs and it keeps coming back and forth and it keeps adding <laughs> on every time it goes through the border ah. and the price is going to go up so much. And, uh, and of course, you know, like Tesla has factories in Mexico, you know, they do production in Mexico. And then, of course, there's no tariff between Mexico and U.S., so they can just send to U.S. and sell them. And, you know, um, it's Tesla is an American car, right? Yeah. So we don't say it's an imported car. It's an American car. But there's a lot of uh, that going on. Um, so I don't know how Trump would be able to put tariffs on Mexico, um, because we're also buying a lot of fruits and vegetables and other things from Mexico. So, you know, if you want to pay a lot of money on avocados or, you know, other things, then, um, yeah, we may have. So when, so when Donald Trump embraced Elon Musk as the great white hope for America and talked about what a great businessman he is and what a great manufacturer and talked about Tesla and all of that, what he didn't actually say is, oh, by the way, there are parts in test in the Tesla cars that are made in Mexico, right? Right. No, so, <laughs> go ahead. There's even um, a you know bigger issue here, though, uh, because when we impose a lot of tariffs on Chinese products, and I think Trump said, you know, I'm going to impose sixty percent tariff on everything that comes from China and 10 to 20% on every other import. Right. Uh, so what Chinese companies have done, uh, especially since 2022, uh, they have found that Chinese uh, shipments to Mexico has gone up so significantly. Um, and the reason is because a lot of those companies in China are now opening up shop in Mexico because... Okay. If you can just send all the raw materials and everything to Mexico and produce them there, then the label becomes made in Mexico. Uh -huh. And now okay. you can just ship it to the United States tariff free, right? And sell it to the United States. So even though we're not buying anything from China, China is still selling us their product uh, through Mexico. With a made in Mexico label. With a made in Mexico label. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I mean, you know, some of this can be illegal trade too, but if you have a factory in Mexico and you're producing everything there, then it's legal to put made in Mexico uh, labels on them and then send them to the United States as me Mexican products. So there are a lot of loopholes and I think uh, we have to be really careful about what kind of tariffs 
and um, how we want to impose them. So let me just go back to this. Uh, now, when you have tariffs, um, I mentioned, you know, the other countries are yes. not just going to take it laying down. They are going to retaliate because we also sell to them. We sell a lot of our products to China, Canada, Mexico, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium. Like we sell a lot of products to other countries too. So when they impose tariffs on our products in their own country, now we are going to have reduced sales. You know, they may see some reduced sales for the tariffs we impose here. Right. But then they are going to put tariffs on our exports. And now you're starting a trade war right? It's going to yeah. be a lot of tension. It will impact international relations. So, you know, there are issues. I mean, there are certain cases where you may want to put some pressure on the other country, but you have to be really careful about what products and what kind of uh, relationship you want to have with those countries or how much you rely on them to buy your products. I mean, it will also disrupt you know, the sourcing of goods in the supply chain. So there will be a lot of issues with that. Okay. Before you go but, forward, before you go forward, let me ask this question. Um, if Donald Trump goes through and, and starts imposing tariffs on imports from around the world, don't know which countries, but you know, he just sort of, to keep his promises to his supporters, he starts um, uh, adding tariffs to whatever products are coming into the, into the United States. And countries retaliate. Which manufacturers in America would get hurt the most if, through this retaliation? Can you, can you sort of... Well, if we impose a lot of tariffs on... Fashion goods, for example, right. I think consumers are going to be hurt a lot um, because with fashion goods, tariffs have uh, an increased impact as the product goes through the supply chain as well. So uh, I actually had an example. I can show you that. Right. I think, let's say, say this is Levi's still, and let's say they're producing in the U.S., but they still have to import cotton, right? Okay. Um, and... You need about three pounds of cotton to make one pair of jeans. So you're going to pay um, the price of cotton to import the yeah. raw material. That's all you need. And then you produce everything in the U.S. But you pay $1.29 for three pounds of cotton. And then the tariff is only 72 cents for the raw material. So okay. you are paying two. I mean, the importer, the cotton importers are paying about $2. And then they sell the cotton to the spinning mills, to yarn mills, uh, which are making the cotton yarns out of cotton fibers. So they make a markup. So every time they do the markup, you know, they double the price. And of course, the tariff gets doubled as well inside that price. So then the, the cotton yarns are sold to the fabric manufacturer and the fabric manufacturer pays double. And then it goes to apparel manufacturer the fabric manufacturer sells it to the apparel manufacturer in a double price. And then it goes to the retailer who buys it from the manufacturers. And then it doubles at the end at the retail store and the consumer pays $64. So out of that $64, it, there is $23, which is just the tariff. Duty is the dollar amount of tariff. Like if there's a 56% tariff on cotton, you know, that keeps doubling as it goes through the supply chain and the consumer pays for it, you know, like okay. multiple so, times. So the price goes up. And I think, you know, the uh, fashion industry would be affected a lot because it's a more labor intensive manufacturing and um, the price of everything will go up a lot. Okay. Um, okay. So then, so then let me ask the question. So Don. Donald Trump supporters or Donald Trump himself looks, looking at this chart would say, okay, why do we need to import the cotton? Let's grow the cotton. Why do we need, you know, the, let's open the yarn mills. Let's open fabric mills. Let, let's, uh, you know, the apparel manufacturer in, in America can buy the fabric. Retailer buys the jeans and then the consumer buys the jeans. So how, how realistic or unrealistic it is to say, we don't need to have any of this done overseas or abroad. It can all be done in America. 
including the growing of the cotton? I mean, uh, you can do that, of course. Um, there used to be cotton farmers in Alabama, right. Georgia, right? Right. Uh, right? You could open them up again if you can convince the farmers to go into that business again. And then, of course, you have to have uh, people to work in the farms, right? Yes. And so I don't know if you will be able to find workers <laughs> to work in the farms. So you may have to find illegal immigrants, um, but then but, they will be deported. So I don't know who is going to work in the farms. I mean, you can definitely do it if you pay a lot of money to the workers um, to harvest cotton. And then, you know, the spinning and fabric manufacturing. I mean, they're not... They're not industries that you you completely don't want to have any in the U.S. Like you you may want to have a certain amount of manufacturing in the U.S., but I don't know how the prices are going to be at the end. You know, I have a feeling that the prices are going to be super high. And also, uh, we don't really have a lot of cotton manufacturing anymore in right. the U.S. Uh, so generally, we don't put a lot of tariffs on uh, products with cotton but there are certain uh types of items that we impose more tariffs so that the domestic producers can sell their products you know sometimes like certain polyester uh, manufacturers sure. um, because that used to be considered a more value added type of product and it's easier to produce you know it's not a natural fiber you can make it in the factory at high volume Cotton production is not very profitable. So it will be hard to find people who want to grow cotton again. And it's also labor intensive or, you know, sort of, I know it's mechanized and all of that, but right. you still need people to work the fields, yeah. right? The cotton fields and all of that. Um, and then, of course, Donald Trump has talked about deporting 11 million illegal immigrants, many of them who do this kind of work who work the plantations, who work the fields, who work, you know, the farms. Yeah. And so where do those employees come from then? And it's going to be a challenge for the businesses to figure that out. Uh, it's not going to be easy. So let me stop sharing. But um, I mean, there are also other industries that will be affected, like food, fruits and vegetables. You know, you can, of course, we do impose a lot of tariffs on those to uh, support local farmers. Right, uh, right. Already. But uh, there are certain uh, fruits and vegetables that we don't have uh, as much in the U.S. That's enough for the U.S. consumers. So, you know, we may have a shortage. So the shortage may also increase prices. Yeah. So, I mean, there are a lot of different product categories. Now, in certain categories of products, it may be smart to impose tariffs. And I mean, I'm not an expert to determine which products are more critical uh, to the U.S. so that we are not dependent on other countries for these mm -hmm. products. And I would think, you know, probably defense products are important. Right. You don't right. want to depend on other countries completely. Um, like chip manufacturing that the Biden administration right. has spending billions upon billions on to open these factories, right. including one outside Columbus. It's huge. Have we have imposed a lot of tariffs on China. Uh, for example, you know, we we didn't want to buy any chips from China. Right. And we also, uh, because, you know, it's a technology that uh, makes a country more competitive and also it's a safety issue sometimes. Right. Uh, and Chinese uh, companies uh, were also not able to buy, I believe, from the U.S. The trade issue is something that the experts have to decide. You can't just blurt out numbers randomly and say, we're going to impose this much to them. And, you know, and assume that like everybody assumes that when we impose tariffs on other countries, they are punished. Sometimes you are punished. Or is it possible that, okay, so, and, and that was, that was going to be one of my questions is, well, there seems to be an assumption that, all right, Donald Trump is going to impose all of these tariffs on all of these uh, consumer items that come into this country. And really, the importers, the companies that import these or have their products made overseas are going to absorb that cost of the, uh, the higher cost because of the tariffs and not pass it on to consumers. Uh, do you that think is actually, 
<laughs> that's actually, but see, that I think was the missing link in this whole discussion during the campaign, right? Because the companies they, never absorb anything. Okay. They never absorb. I mean, look at the prices at Target. Remember, you know, everybody said, you know, the uh, part of the inflation was caused by those higher mic markups by right. these companies, even though their cost didn't go up. Right. Yes. I mean, they yes. want to make as much profit as possible at any condition, at any circumstance. So if you think that they're going to absorb all these tariffs, I, I don't think they will. I mean, they will always reflect it on their price tags. OK. In your in your study of these issues and, and the, you know, the global um, uh, manufacturing, et cetera. Do price controls work? Um, I mean, I'm not an economist, so I right. can't say a whole lot about price control. But um, I mean, sometimes you have to have certain limitations on how much markup a company can put on right. on products. Of course, you know, in a free economy, it's it's the demand it's, and supply yes. issue. Yes. So if yes. there's a lot of demand and not enough supply, then the companies can jack up their prices, right? Uh, and nobody can do anything about it in a free economy, but um, but there are certain critical products. Maybe you can, uh, or at least you know, if the markups are outrageous, or if the companies are really taking advantage of the consumer, mm -hmm. I think there should be some kind of regulation. Um, but I don't know uh, if that can be applied, you know, across the board. I'm not sure. So Donald Trump succeeded in making this an issue that resonated with consumers because they were unhappy at the price of eggs and, and they're unhappy with uh, you know the price of bread and milk and all of those kinds of things and they all thought that you know Biden had had, had mishandled the economy etc but while it was great for politics American the American political uh, campaign his threat of of tariffs has sent shockwaves throughout the world. In fact, the discussions in every country, including including Western industrial countries, industrialized countries, about what to prepare for, what's going to happen, et cetera. So in your estimation, given your expertise, do you think that a Trump administration will go as far as Donald Trump has threatened or said he would during the campaign, or are cooler heads going to prevail? And are people like Elon Musk, uh, who has, you know, interests around the world, sort of going to advise him saying, you know, it was a great campaign <laughs> issue, but let's face reality. And yeah, this is my personal opinion. Yes. I really don't think he will be able to do that because the business friends he has are probably going to stop him from doing that. You know, understanding Trump's own business, you know, he produced those Bibles in China, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> and, I mean, I'm sure the MAGA hats are all produced in China or made right. in China. So he knows how that works. I don't know if he just doesn't understand tariffs when he talks about that, or he's just too smart and he knows that people are yes. going to be yes. fooled so easily and he can just say that and that will get him votes. I'm not sure which one, but there's another issue here with the Democrats, though, because if you look at Biden's administration, he actually didn't retract any of the tariffs imposed right. during Trump and he imposed even more tariffs. But they never talked about that during their campaign. You know, they never said, oh, we're going to increase tariffs like during Biden, I mean, we had 25% tariff on steel. We have 100% tariff on Chinese, you know, electric cars. We have a huge tariff on like Chinese solar panels. And, you know, there are a lot of tariffs already uh, implemented and even increased during Biden administration. But I think, you know, they just don't know how to catch people's attention as much. Um, and I believe that it's just, you know, Trump just says things uh, that works for him. You know, when he sees that some kind of statement is working with the voters, yes. he doubles down on it and he starts 
saying it more. And I don't know how much of it he's going to do. I mean, I'm sure he will impose certain tariffs, um, but I don't know if he's going to be able to do 60%, 100%. I mean, he even said 200% for <laughs> some things. So his numbers are never like stable. But you know what? But he's also made the calculation that his supporters will follow him blindly. In July of 2017, after he won and after he went into the White House, he came to Youngstown. And he told the story about driving from the airport down to downtown and his wife looking around at all the rustings, you know, old steel mills and all. And she says to him, what happened? And he said, oh, all those jobs went away. And he told 6,000 plus people at Cavalli Center, he says, you know what? Don't sell your homes. Don't move out of this region. You know, all the jobs are coming back. I'm going to start building steel mills, you know, on the banks of the Mahoning River. And all of the auto jobs that have left this region are going to come back to you. Not that that happened. In fact, under his watch, General Motors closed its Lordstown plant. Right. But it didn't hurt him. No. People didn't care. And you're right, but you say at some point, he's his business pals and his billionaire pals who all have involvement in transnational corporations are going to go to the White House and sit down with him and say, eh -eh, this ain't going to happen, right? They can't afford it. The businesses in the U.S., those companies, they can't afford to not import anything from other countries. Like that first <laughs> example I gave you, you know, that was the current situation for Made in USA Levi's. Right, right. If you increase tariffs on them. Yeah, so like if you look at here, let's say we impose like $10 more tariffs on Chinese products here, you know, so the cost of the product is going to go to $30, right? Right. They'll put a $30 markup and the price is going to be $60. I mean, yeah. it's still cheaper than making it in the US, right? Even when yeah. you impose that high tariff, people are still going to buy them. They may not buy as many anymore, right? Uh, right. I mean, it may actually have a good impact because, you know, there's this whole fast fashion craze right. that right. everybody's buying clothes right and left and they are so cheap and then they don't even wear half of them. It goes to the landfills, right? So maybe people will buy I, I wouldn't know any of that because the last clothes I bought was 10 years ago, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, there is a lot of... Uh, extravagance on right. expenditures yeah. because it's so cheap nowadays. And you can also buy from China directly. There are websites where you can just go online and buy stuff. You know, everything is so much cheaper than before. Could so, you explain that some more? What do you mean buy directly from China? Um, I mean, you know, there are websites like Temu and or Timu. I don't know how it's pronounced. Yeah. You know, there are certain Chinese websites or Alibaba.com, for example. Uh, that's like the biggest competition to Amazon. Yes. And yes. you can go and order stuff from them. It takes maybe 15, 20 days to arrive, but it's so much cheaper than buying it on Amazon, right? So you can order products directly as a consumer uh, from China. And I believe there's no tariff on it if it is less than a certain amount. Okay. Um, so... I don't know if it's like less than $800 or there's something. Oh, like that. wow. So if you order something from Alibaba.com, you know, you may have to wait for a month for it to arrive, but it will be. Right. <laughs> so. So that's an that's an option that American consumers would have. Un un unless Donald Trump. I believe Trump they already have it. I mean, people okay. can order things. Um, no, but if the tariffs are imposed and prices go skyrocket. So there is a way out for American consumers, right? They can go. Well, I mean, if there are tariffs like that, I'm sure they will put tariffs on Alibaba.com and all these other. But it would still be cheaper, wow. right? It may still be cheaper. Um, yeah. And in that case, maybe we are going to have to pay shipping plus yeah. Yeah. tariff. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how it would work. But I mean, if we are trying to limit imports from China, then I'm sure they will put some kind of limits uh, or restriction on those as well. But also, okay. you know, another thing is like tariffs are not the only trade barriers that you can use. There are also other ways to help domestic producers. We used to have quotas on uh, products coming from China 
China right. became a member of World Trade Organization in 2001, and there was already a push for more free trade around the world. Because, right. you know, World Trade Organization believes in free trade. They think that it benefits consumers overall, uh, all around the world. And <clears throat> so they wanted to eliminate quotas. Uh, so in the past, like we had limits to, for example, how many uh, trousers you can mm -hmm. buy from China. Like once it hits that limit during the year, after that, right. China couldn't ship any, any more of those. And then they were uh, eliminated in I believe it was 2002 when they got eliminated and that's when Chinese imports just flooded the market in the US. Well, as a professor in uh, fashion merchandising who, who taught the course called Global Fashion Economy, when you heard Donald Trump talk about tariffs and you know going all out about it, what was your immediate reaction? <laughs> you know, what I thought was, my students are not going to fall for this one <laughs> <laughs> because I talk about tariffs. I explain how it works in class. We do calculations, you know, like if you're importing chickens and there's this much tariff on, you know, chickens, how right. you calculate. And I thought, you know, my students know this is not right. Um, but I mean, a lot of people don't. And I think um, yeah, there's yeah. so much we don't know. Not everybody has the means to understand you know yes. if you're not involved in trade you don't know what tariffs are right so exactly yeah so i understand that people don't know how they work and i think you know it's important that we explain how that works yes it is when people hear things they know how to how which to, is how to which, evaluate it yeah but um, before we sign up which is why um the next one of the next podcasts we're going to do is on immigration and the reality of um, sort of throwing out um, 11 million people, you know, deporting 11 million illegal immigrants. And, uh, you know, once again, we'll, we'll find some experts to talk about mm -hmm. the reality of that and the economic effects of getting rid of you know, these kinds, these people who actually not all 11 million immigrants are on public assistance, you know, seeking free housing, free food, free hospital care and all of that. There are these illegal immigrants who are working. Well, who are also, filling jobs and the illegal, the illegality of immigrants is also in question. Uh, I met this girl on the plane when I was going to Turkey, she was from Turkey and she said, you know, she's a college student in Turkey and she said she came to the U.S. for three months and she's going back home. I said, what, what did you do in the U.S.? She said, um, I applied for this temporary work visa uh, yes. because there are these companies, they need uh, lifeguards in their pools and they can't find uh. American kids to be lifeguards. So they are hiring from Europe, from Turkey, you know, from other countries, like college students. They give them a temporary visa status. The company sponsors that. And then they come and work for three months and then they go back to their country. But it's legal for them to work. They're not immigrants. They're just temporarily there right. to do the job right. because these companies can't find anybody to do the job in like scorching heat, sit there and yes. Yes. watch you know, watch the beach or watch the pools. Tariffs are similar, you know, it hurts domestic companies too. And ultimately consumers as well. Consumers the most, but yes. yeah. in, in different ways, the companies, the American sure. companies also get hurt. Well, this has been fascinating. And you know, had I known that you were teaching this class, I would have taken it while you were still on <laughs> still at YSU. But we'll be talking again. Thanks, Sarji. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you.